So we are continuing this series called Jesus 101. How many of you guys at your workplace, you have a job description like that you, like they gave you, here's what you're supposed to do. How many of you guys have one, but you've never seen it? Like you, you don't even know what it is, right? Uh, when I was a youth pastor, I, was, I was just turned 21 and they told me, um, I said, well, what's my job description? They said, you make it up. And I was like, that's a dangerous thing for a 21 year old to say, make up your own job description. Um, but I was thinking this week, like what would Jesus job description be when he was on the planet? Like, cause he, he was actually on the planet walking around among us for a season of time. And if we were to try to put a job description to what that would have been and what his job description is, what would it be? And I think we can find it uh, if we look close enough. And it's really, we don't even have to look very close because it's fairly obvious. But we're going to look at a story that we call the 10 lepers because Jesus is out healing people. He's walking around and he comes across you guessed it, 10 lepers. And in, in Jesus' day, if you had leprosy, of course, it was physically devastating because it was basically eating away at your body, but it was also emotionally devastating and socially devastating because once you had it, you had to leave your life as you knew it. You had to leave your family as you knew it. And you had to uh, get outside of all of society and live with other lepers. And if someone came near you, you'd have to cry out and you'd say, unclean, unclean, you can't come near me. And so it was a, basically a death sentence if you had leprosy. And, and so these 10 lepers are out, uh, out of society and here comes Jesus. No doubt they had heard about Jesus because they begin to cry out to him. And they say, Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus does the unthinkable in that day and he comes near. And he, said, and he begins to heal them. And, and he says, go show yourself to the priest. Because in those days, you would have to go to the priest to get a clear bill of health so that you could return back to society. And so he says, you're healed. Go show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says something interesting. It says, as they went, they were cleansed. Which indicates that when they left Jesus, they still had visible signs of leprosy. So they had to leave that moment just at the word of Jesus that they were healed. And as they went... They were healed, and we know it was as they went because of Luke chapter 17, verse 15. It says, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back. So he's walking along, and he's like, I'm healed. He turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered, we're not ten cleansed. Where are the nine? Where, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, little Bible study here, that, that phrase, made you well, contains a word in the Greek. Boil it down, is, is basically the word sozo. And the word sozo has several meanings, but it can basically be summed up in three words. To save, to deliver, and to heal. And in this one word, sozo, we find the job description of Jesus when he was on the planet, that he came to save, he came to deliver, and he came to heal. And we know this is also true because this is what Jesus said about himself. There were prophecies about Jesus, and in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus confirms that this is his job description, this is his mission and it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, salvation, to uh, proclaim liberty to those who are captives, deliverance, and to recover, uh, recovering of sight to the blind, there's healing, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So we get deliver, deliverance in there twice to set people free. So we see in Jesus' own words, the prophecies about Jesus and what Jesus did is this word sozo that we could say it this way, and I'm just going to make up this word here, that Jesus just went about sozoing all the time. That's just what Jesus did. He just sozoed everywhere that he went, and over and over again. And something interesting would happen whenever he would sozo, or whenever he would heal somebody, or set somebody free, several times he would say something like this, now the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. And he was announcing through this act that you are tasting and seeing some of what heaven is is like and the kingdom of God is like. We see it again in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons. And he cast out the spirits with the word and he healed all who were sick. Everybody say all. Just making sure we caught that, that he healed all who were sick. So there goes Jesus. He's sozoing again, right? He's just sozoing again. Now, I want to be very clear about this, that in Jesus' day, there were people 
who were physically sick, physically injured, physically not well. And when Jesus prayed for them, they literally and physically, not just emotionally or spiritually, even though that happens and that was good, but they literally and physically were made well. So people in our day, if we saw somebody in a wheelchair who could never walk, when they came across Jesus, they were literally able to have strength in their body, restored full health. They were able to walk completely again. People who were blind from birth had never seen anything, literally were physically, their eyes were able to now see. I just want to be, care, be clear about that. It wasn't just a, an, an emotional thing or a spiritual healing or an inner... He physically healed people. And I also want to be clear about this, that there were people in Jesus' day who were literally, they, they were oppressed and possessed by demonic spirits. Do you guys know that, that there's a world that we can't taste, see, touch, hear with our physical senses? There isn't another world that we interact with. Well, in Jesus' day, there were people who were literally possessed and influenced by demonic spirits that Jesus came and tormented by them. That Jesus would come and cast those spirits out and they were set free. Okay, those things really happen. Now here's the question I have for you. Does God still sozo? I don't know many of us would say yes, but I, I want you to take a careful look at that in your own heart because many of us, our automatic yes is yes, God still saves. Yes, God still saves. And we might even go so far as to say, yes, God delivers, because I, you know, I, I kind of was in a problem and then now I'm not in a problem. You know? But I'm talking about, does God still come across people who are impacted and influenced, oppressed, and even possessed by demonic spirits and set people free? Does God still physically, not just emotionally, spiritually, although those things are great and we need those, but does he still physically heal people today? Does God still so so? And the, the, the thing is, a lot of people say yes, and yet a lot of people still struggle with it. And so my thing is today that if, if this is true, if Jesus still sozos today, and he still saves, delivers, and heals, and he even announced that the kingdom of God had come when those things happened, isn't it sad that so many believers and in the church and so many churches fail to talk about these things? Like we're scared to talk about them, like it's, it's not a good seeker-friendly message. <laughs> but I can tell you in Jesus' day, it was a great first-time guest message. Because people would come and they'd get saved, they'd get delivered, they'd get healed. They're like, man, this Jesus is awesome. So isn't it sad that if Jesus still sozos, and if you are struggling with this, like you, you wonder, does God still heal today, physically? I can't. I don't know what you do with things that I've personally seen with my physical eyes. Things like right here in this church. We've had people in this church who had blood clots disappear, tumors disappear. People who were going and scheduled for a surgery had been looked at multiple times, MRIs, all that type of stuff. They show up for the surgery and they realize it doesn't have to be done because we prayed before they had surgery. We have miracle babies in this church that weren't supposed to be conceived or born or had problems that they weren't supposed to live. They are miracle babies in this church church. I've seen it with my own eyes. We saw somebody, many people down here at first service and last night, testimonies already of people being healed physically. So I, I don't know about you, but I can't uh, not say that because I've seen it with my own eyes that God still saves, delivers, and heals. And, and if that is you, and if you say, yes, I do believe that, you still might have some other questions. One question might be this. If I'm a believer, which many of us in this room probably are, if I'm a believer in Jesus, do I even need to be set free or delivered? Because I'm a new creation. How is it possible that a demonic spirit could be in me? Because I'm a believer. I don't even need that, right? Well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to answer that question. The second thing you might have a question on is if Jesus paid the price for healing and he healed all when he was on the planet sozoing around, why is it that believers still get sick? And how do I receive healing? And so I wanna talk about that and do the best job that we can today to help answer that or help move us forward in that area. But one way that we can kind of look at that is um, 
is trying to understand the past, present, and future. And Pastor Robert Morris is the guy who does the best job on that, and so I'm going to let him take it. So let's take a look. Well, why do we still get sick? Well, let me help you. <laughs> did Jesus, you can answer out loud, every campus, did Jesus bear our sins on the cross? Yes. But you still sin. I mean, y'all do. I don't, personally, but <laughs> y'all do. That was a sin, by the way, right there, right in front of your eyes, that was a sin. Okay, that was a lie. All right. Well, wait a minute. See, I, if he bore my sins, why do I still sin? Okay, but, but let's agree, Christians still sin. They're not perfect, right? So this is going to help you a little bit. He bore your sin on the cross. He did. Yet we still sin. Okay, he bore your sickness. Yeah, you know, we still get sick sometimes. Why? Well, theologically, I'm going to explain to you, but the, ma the main reason is we live in a fallen world. We live in a sin-filled, sickness-filled world. But there's a new world coming <laughs> with no sin and no sickness in it. Okay, so, but let me show you what he bore. Let me show you what he bore on the cross. He bore the penalty of our sins, he bore the power of our sins, and he bore the presence of our sins. He also bore penalty, power, and presence of our sicknesses. But remember, Jesus, here's what it says several times about Jesus. He was, he is, and he is to come. Here's another thing. We read it last week. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is not bound by time. Here's another way to say it. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Are y'all with me? So, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We have been. If you believed, Jesus has done it. He has saved you from the penalty of sin. The chastisement, which the word there means punishment, the punishment for our peace was put on him. It's put on him. So I've been saved if I, once I believe from the penalty of sin. One day, I'm gonna be saved from the presence of sin, right? I'll be saved from the presence of sin, no sin in heaven. I've also been saved from the penalty of sickness. And one day I'll be saved from the presence of sin, sickness. But right now, I'm being, I'm being saved from the power of sin and I'm being saved from the power of sickness. The more I let the word get in me, Psalm 107.20 says he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. The more I allow the word of God to work in me, the more power I have to overcome sin. And the more power I have even to understand that healing comes from God. And I'm gonna talk in a moment about the two extremes. But here's the main thing I wanna to say to you. You have been saved from the penalty of sin. Everyone agree with that? Please hear me. You have been saved from the penalty of sickness. Please hear me. God will never put sickness on you to discipline you. God's not doing that. Now, you can say, well, I've learned something through this. Well, we learn something through everything, hopefully. But it's not God putting it on you. And, and I'll tell you, theologically, I don't have time to develop this, but God can't, he can't punish you for your sin because he's already punished Jesus. He can't punish two people for the same crime. All right, so that lays a foundation for where we're going. So we uh, have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved uh, in that sense. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. So here's the question, does God still heal? And I want you to know that I have personally experienced supernatural healing in my life, like multiple times. And I've also prayed to be healed before and not seen that happen. So I understand the tension of that, and I don't want to dismiss that. But we do want to grow in that. And so when it comes to any topic in the Bible or like healing or anything like that, we don't want to lean on formulas because it's so tempting for us to try to come up with formulas. What we want to lean into are truths, okay? 
So I want to give you, and I gave you these last year about this time, but I'm going to rapid fire these at you. So if you're writing these down, you better write fast. But I'm going to give you seven truths about healing that are going to lay a foundation uh, for what we're going to do today. And I'm going to go through them really, really quick, but I believe it's important for me to do this. Number one is this, God wants you healed. You have to get this in your spirit, that God wants you healed. Now, if you struggle with this and you say, I don't know if God wants me healed or not, then when you are sick, stop trying to work against God's will by trying to get well. Because a lot of times people will say, I don't know if it's, if, if it's God's will for me to be healed or if God wants me well, maybe he's trying to you know, teach me something or whatever. I don't know if, that, then stop going to the doctor. Then stop going, taking medicine. Then stop trying to take care of you. No, see, a lot of us, we, we are in this tension fighting against this mindset that we can't settle in our heart that God wants you healed. He wants you healed. That's his desire for you. In fact, we know at the end that in heaven there is no sickness, right? There's no sorrow. There's no tears. We know that God's end game is that there's no sickness. So God's desire all along from the garden to heaven is that we would, we would be made whole. Number two is this. I'll echo Pastor Robert that God never puts sickness on you to teach you a lesson. Now, sometimes we don't understand why certain things happen. And we struggle with that. But here's what, let me just tell you what I do when I don't understand something fully. When I don't understand something fully, I go back to the things that I do know fully. And what I do know fully is that the word of God says that God is a loving father. And there's not a loving father in this room who would ever put sickness on one of their children just to teach them something. And the Bible says that as good as we can be as loving fathers, that he's even a better father than that. So God will never put sickness on you to teach you a lesson because God is a loving father. Number three, Jesus already paid the price on the cross for salvation and for your healing. So when I sin, I don't have to ask Jesus to crawl back up on the cross and die again for my sin every time that I sin, right? That'd be crazy. He did it once for all. And he also paid for our healing on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sickness on the cross so that whenever I get sick, I don't have to ask God to do something he's already done. He's already paid the price. He doesn't have to do something new. He's already done it. Number four, because of that, when we pray, we don't have to beg God to do something he's already done. So many times when people pray for healing, it's like they're begging God, oh, Lord, please, 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 please. You know, like if we can just get on God's good side, you know, if we could just somehow get God to do something, we don't have to beg God to do something he's already done. We simply use the authority he's already given us over sickness or over a spirit of infirmity, and we command it to leave. Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, he called the 12 together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Question, was this just for that, those 12? Or was it for all of us? Well, if this was just for the 12, then what about the Great Commission? Was the Great Commission for just the 12 to go into all the world? Or is it for all of us? No, it's for all of us that he gave us any disciple power, authority. All right, number five. Faith is a factor in our healing. But it's not faith in our faith. This is sometimes we can get off, we can, we can try to, well, do I have enough faith? I gotta muster up enough. And faith is a factor in our healing. But what, what we tend to do then is to try to measure, do I have enough faith? And we start putting our faith in how much faith we have. But faith is simply confidence in what God has already done for us. So if we were to measure our faith, it's not how much faith we have, but it's how much confidence we have in God. Okay, number six. Because of that, we do need to renew our minds, though. We have to renew our minds to start living in the kingdom of God in the here and now. See, we are living in the tension of what God has done for us and one day what he will do in all of that. And we pull that into the now. The Bible says to pray on earth as it is in heaven right now. So that we can become, even though we're in the midst of a fallen world, we can become conduits from heaven to earth in the here and now. That's what he's called us to do. Become conduits in the here and now. Now, number seven, not everyone gets healed. How many of you guys have ever prayed for healing and didn't see it before? I mean, I've got my hand up. Okay, not everyone gets healed. And we don't always know why. 
But let me be clear about this. That does not change any of those other truths that I just said. See, sometimes when we don't experience healing, what we want to do is we want to go back and we want to say, well, maybe God doesn't want me healed and I need to change that about my theology. Or we don't see a healing and we go back and we say, well, maybe God's trying to teach me a lesson. Or we go back and we try to say, well, maybe God doesn't give me the authority. You see, just because we don't see someone healed, it doesn't change any of those other truths because those truths do not change. So what I'm saying is Jesus is still sozoing and he wants to heal today. And he's going to heal some of you today. Like even before we get out of this room, he's going to heal some of you today. So get ready. Second question is this. Does God still set people free? Or more specifically, for those of us who are believers in this room, let me ask it this way. As a believer, can I be possessed by a demonic spirit? That's a fun question, right? Like, <laughs> as a believer, let me just answer it real quick, and then I'll just I'll share with you some things that are going to be helpful. No, I do not believe, as a believer, that you can be possessed by a demonic spirit. I do believe, according to the Word of God, and we're going to look at this here in just a second, that you can be influenced and even oppressed by a demonic spirit in your life. Why is that? Well, let me just show you one example that I hadn't seen until this week, but there's a, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he, he says, there's a lot of people who say who I am, but he goes on in verse 15, he says, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So Peter basically says, you are the son of God. He confesses Jesus as Lord. That's what he's doing right here. And Jesus answered him, he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, you didn't just come to this conclusion naturally, but this was something that was revealed to you by the Father. This was something that happened supernaturally or spiritually. It was revealed to you by my Father who is in heaven. So he's recognized who Jesus is. He confesses Jesus. He, and Jesus confirms this wasn't just something that happened in the natural. This is something that was revealed. And then he goes on and Jesus says, and I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. So Jesus says, because you have this revelation now, because you've confessed this, I'm gonna use you to build the church. And in fact, I'm even gonna go further. The gates of hell is not gonna be, be able to stand against the church that's gonna be built. And I tell you uh, that I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. How many of you guys know this was a pretty big day for Peter, wasn't it? I mean, he's confessed Jesus as Lord. It, Jesus confirms, man, that was a big revelation. I'm gonna give you keys. You're gonna help build the church. This is awesome. The very next thing that happens, Jesus talks about how he's gonna be crucified. The very next thing that happens, it happens in Mark, it happens in Matthew. Very next thing that happens after all this, Peter takes Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, that you, this should never happen to you. But watch this. Jesus turns and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Peter just confessed that Jesus is Lord. Jesus just confirmed that it was revealed to him by the Father. He just got some keys to help build the church. And then the next thing that Jesus says to him is, Get behind me, Satan. What was going on? Well, what was happening here is it says, but he turned and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance for me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. What was happening? Immediately, Peter had some areas of his life where Satan had a foothold in his life, where Satan had come and claimed territory in his thinking, claimed territory. And, and we can have this happen even as believers, where we can give opportunity to the enemy to give a strong, how is this possible? Well, it's possible because we are made up of three parts. We are a spirit, soul, and a body, right? We are triune beings. Just like God is a trinity, we are a trinity because our spirit, when you got saved, your spirit was made alive. There is no way that Satan or any demon can come and inhabit your spirit. That's been something that's been made alive in Christ, okay? And so you, your spirit has been saved, your body, one day in heaven at the resurrection, will be completely saved and made whole. In fact, we get glorified bodies in the end, right? So in the end, our bodies will be saved. What's happening in the in-between? Our soul is being saved. 
The Bible talks about renewing our mind. Why do we have to renew our mind? Because our soul is in the process, our mind, our will, our emotions, our thought life. Have you ever had a thought come into your mind that you thought, that wasn't from me? That was from the enemy. That wasn't good. (laughs) Do you realize that you are not the architect of every thought that comes into your mind? Satan will come and he will try to get territory in your life. And if you allow, and listen, we open the doors sometimes. We open the doors because of, because of doubt, because of unbelief, because of fear, because of something that might make us feel more comforted. We open the doors in our life to give opportunity for the devil. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse four and five says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Why do we take every thought captive to obey Christ? Because some of them have gone astray. And if we allow it to go astray for long enough, it becomes a stronghold in our life that we have to tear down, that we have to evict out of our life. It it becomes a place where Satan has got an opportunity or demonic spirit has got an opportunity, not in our spirit, but in our soul, in the life of our mind, our will, and our emotions, okay? And It says in Ephesians chapter four, verse 27, it says, and give no opportunity for the devil. If it wasn't possible for the devil to have an opportunity, this verse wouldn't be in there. (laughs) But as believers, evidently there's an opportunity that the devil can come or demonic spirits can come into our thought life, into our mindsets because of doors that we've opened in our life, even as believers. And so some people say, well, I don't even have to worry about that because I'm a believer. I don't even have to worry about that. And yet, on the other extreme, so have you ever met somebody who everything's a demon? <laughs> everything's a spiritual battle. Everything's a spiritual warfare thing. Everything is, like, so we kind of have these two extremes. And, and the people over here where everything, there's a demon behind everything, what happens is we tend to end up glorifying Satan's work more than it, and give it more credit than what it really is. So let me give you three quick things. I'm gonna fire these right at you that sometimes we make a mistake when it comes to the enemy. Number one, we forget that he's a created being. Satan is a created being. See, sometimes we think that like there's good God, all powerful good God, and then there's bad God like Satan and they're battling it out. And if they were to arm wrestle, God would win, but just barely. And that's sometimes how we think about it, right? But that's not true. God is all powerful. Satan is a created being. And sometimes we'll look at what Satan or demonic spirits are doing in somebody's life and we'll think, man, Satan must be very, very powerful or demonic spirits must be very powerful. But that leads me to number two. We measure, this is a mistake, we measure Satan's power by the response of those not walking in Jesus' authority. So what we see then is we see Satan or demonic spirit wreaking havoc in somebody's life and we think that that that's the access Satan has to our life when in fact those people are simply not taking the authority that they have in Jesus Christ. Which leads us to number three. Sometimes in our own life, we fail to resist Satan and we feel powerless. But the Bible says in James chapter four, verse seven, so humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee. It doesn't say maybe he will flee. It says and he will flee. So how big is God in your life? Well, God is as big as you allow him to be, right? That's how big God is. How big is Satan in your life? He's as big as you allow him to be. And he's as small as you resist him to be. He's as big as you allow him to be, as as small as you resist him to be. What I'm saying is Satan only has power in your life to the degree that you resist him or not. And you need to get that in your spirit. I'm not saying that demonic spirits don't have power, but what I'm saying is once we recognize what's happening and we recognize their agenda, we now have all power in that situation. Somebody needs to get a hold of that. Let me say that again, because I don't think you caught that. That I'm not saying that they don't have any power, but what I'm saying is that once we recognize what their agenda is in our situation, in our relationships, in our lives, once we see what they're doing, we now have all power because Jesus delegated his power to us. We now have all power. Matthew chapter 10, verse one. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. So how do I approach demonic spirits? 
I, I don't get too worked up about it, honestly, because I know who I am in Jesus Christ. I know that he gave me his authority. And we either have the authority or we don't. And the fact is, we do. And so when I pray for somebody that I know they have something going on, sometimes we tend to glorify it and just think, oh, it's going to be crazy like the movies and all sorts of things like that. I just don't allow that because I have authority in the situation because Jesus gave me the authority and I'm not going to let Satan try to put his show on display. We have the authority. It's, what I'm saying is it's not that complicated or not as complicated as we make it. Now to help us kind of come in for a landing here and talk about how we pray for these things. How do we pray for healing? How do we pray to be set free? It's not that complicated. And I, I wanna just kind of illustrate that by this next video, so take a look. All right, as we wrap up today, I just wanna deal with two myths that I think we need to really bust in this area if we're gonna see some things happen in this area. And the first myth is this, that prayer for healing, or to be set free has to be really hard and really complicated. And that's what a lot of times we think, it's gotta be really hard and really complicated. So to deal with that, I wanna go back to the story of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Remember, uh, he, he gets permission from Pharaoh to let his people go and they take off and they end up against the Red Sea, this insurmountable problem. They can't cross it. And then all of a sudden Pharaoh changes his mind and now he's coming after them. So they're stuck between Pharaoh and this water. And sometimes that's how we can feel with our healing or maybe in a pattern in our life we keep getting over and over and over again that it seems like, man, how's this ever going to change? How are we going to make it through this? I want you to see something interesting in that story though, because we ultimately know that God does part the water. God does this miracle. But I want you to see what happened in there. It was God who parted the water. It wasn't Moses' job to move the gallons of water. It wasn't Moses' job to do this incredible miracle. What did God ask Moses to do? He said, Moses, what, what do you got there? And Moses is like, well, I, I, I got a stick. This is your staff there, Moses. I want you just to lift up your staff up over the water. So as Moses lifted up his staff over the water, God did the miracle. God parted the water. What am I saying? I'm saying what God asks us to do is not complicated. God, God doesn't want us to part the water. Jesus has already done the heavy lifting. In our healing, Jesus has already done the heavy lifting on the cross. To defeat Satan, we, we don't have to do that. Jesus has already done the heavy lifting. He simply asks us to do something very simple. And I've looked all throughout the stories of miracles in the New Testament, and the pattern was pretty simple. Jesus would see somebody in need, see somebody who need healed, and he would simply command them to be healed. That was it. And Jesus is our model. Jesus is our pattern. He, the, the pattern was simply pray, command, check. Pray, command, check. Jesus, it, it's God's part to do the miracle. It's our part to do obedience. We don't have to work something up. In fact, Jesus didn't even ask the Father to heal. He simply commanded them to be well. Well, we don't have to ask the Father even to heal we just simply use the authority that we have to speak to the situation and we just simply lift up our staff. And God is already going, God has already done the heavy lifting. He is going to do the miracle. The question is, will we do the very simple thing of lifting up our staff? Will we do the very simple thing of stepping out and commanding the situation in the authority that we have in Jesus name? All right, by the way, that wasn't the actual Red Sea. Just kind of letting you know, we didn't have the budget for that. Um, but I do want to give you the second myth, okay? The second myth. The first myth is it's got to be really hard. The second myth is this, and I'm going to have our worship team come back up because we're getting ready to pray for you right now. But the second myth is this, my miracle track record in the past will be my miracle track record in the future. See, sometimes we've had disappointments in the past, and we get into this mindset that my track record of miracles, my track record of healing, my track record of prayer, my track record in the past is going to be my track record in the future. And that's simply not true. And I understand because many people have had, I mean, listen, as a pastor, I've grieved with many people in this church over the years who we didn't see the things that we wanted to see. But at the same time, we don't have to settle for that. We can continue to lean in, to grow. We can declare. And maybe you need to declare that you're entering into a new season by faith. Maybe you just need to receive that you're entering into a new season because it's a dangerous place for believers to be when we take our experience and try to change our theology based on our experience and take, instead of taking God's word and letting that dictate what we believe. 
And so we, many of us, we've experienced things that we didn't like to see or we thought would go a different way. And, and what I'm saying is be careful not to change what the word of God says based on your experience. Instead, let's lean back into the truth of God's word. Last scripture, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Let me just say it again. Jesus said, I'm gonna give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus has given us authority. And that doesn't mean that he's just given Pastor Sean authority or Pastor Aaron authority or some missionary authority. It means if you are a believer in Jesus, he's given you the authority. You, you can put your name in there that he's given you the authority. Now we're going to pray for you very shortly. We're going to pray and we're going to agree with you and we're going to help you with that. But I want you to understand that when you walk out of this place, you have the authority. You have the keys. You have the authority. And some of you, I just want you to hear this, that you could be one faith step away from experiencing the victory that God has for you in your life. If we'd simply lift up our staff, if we'd simply take another chance, if we'd simply open up our heart once again. And so we're going to do that right now. I'm going to ask our prayer teams to come forward at this time, and I'm going to ask all of you to stand up with me. And here in just a moment, if you need prayer for something, for healing or to be set free in an area, you recognize in your life, you have this mindset, you have this stronghold, you have this area that maybe up until this point, you wouldn't have given, you wouldn't have acknowledged that it was a demonic thing or something that needed to be evicted from your life. But now you're like, I don't know, this seems to be something where maybe I've opened up a door to the enemy and I need to evict him out of my life. We're here to help you do that. We're here to help pray with you to do that. See, Jesus has given you the authority. He's given us the authority. But just because he's given you the authority doesn't mean you're using it. See, sometimes we don't see the results that we want because we haven't taken the step to actually exercise the authority that Jesus has given us. And that's what we're gonna do right now. So I'm gonna pray and then I'm gonna invite you to come and we're gonna see some miracles happen today just like we have in the other services. And so, Lord, we thank you so much, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross, that you bore our sins, that you bore our sicknesses, you bore our iniquities, you bore our infirmities, and you paid the price on the cross. And you don't have to come and do that all over again every time we sin or every time we need a healing. We don't have to beg you to do something you've already done, but we partner with you through prayer. And Lord, we we just make a decision right now that we're gonna use the authority that we have in you and receive healing, receive freedom because of your grace. It's not based on our works, just like salvation. It's not based on our works. It's not based on what we can do. It's based on what you have done and we simply choose to receive today. And so Lord, we declare in advance that many people are gonna be set free, healed, even saved today. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you, you need prayer for your, a physical thing in your body that you need to be healed of, then I want to invite you to come right now. I mean, somebody's got to be the first person to step out. So come on and we'll make a line. We'll do whatever we have to do to, to do this. And we're going to worship while we're doing this. If you need prayer for some stronghold in your life, you need to be set free. In fact, if you just need prayer at all, we're here to pray for you. So come on up and we're going to pray. And listen, if you don't need prayer for any of these things, This isn't a time for you just to sit back. This is a time for you to enter into a time of worship, to enter into a time of prayer. Maybe scan across the front of the auditorium. Maybe you'll see somebody that you know that you want to start to pray for. Maybe you see somebody across the front of the auditorium that all of a sudden God just puts on your heart to begin to pray for them. You begin to intercede for them, begin to pray for other people. If you know somebody who's not here and you want to stand in for them, for their healing, we'll pray for you for that as well. But what I want to encourage you is don't miss the moment. It's not complicated. Just step out by faith and God's going to do some miracles. So let's pray. Let's worship. Let's see God move.